Okay, we're here in a rather beautiful part of Gamescom, it's the Project Cars booth uh, with 4K screens and Oculus Rifts all over the place and these two fine specimens of gentlemen right here. Guys, how's Gamescom for you? I'll start with you and then I'll work to you. Yeah, it's my, my first time here at Gamescom and uh, to be doing it with Project Cars is, is pretty cool, pretty special, a game that I've worked closely with so I'm uh, very excited, going to have a look around later but uh, we've been in here answering a few questions and uh, showing the game off so far. Hey, yeah, it's good. It's always hot, you know, but uh, and it's only the first day, so it's going to get even hotter over the next few days. But yeah, it's busy, and it seems to get bigger every year as well. So yeah, Gamescom's uh, always a, a pleasure to come to. Well, you guys obviously have a big presence here, and we've been tracking the progress of the game for, well, since inception, basically. One thing I just want to start off with, the actual logo and the actual the color coding here. Is there any particular story behind it, or just, it just looked pretty on screen? You thought, yeah, we'll go with that. I mean, well, I don't know, but I mean, the uh, I mean, the logo actually represents the four kind of key pillars of the game. So, uh, career, solo, online, and community. So, those are kind of like the four main uh, ways we want people to be playing. You know, we want to be people to be playing in career mode and have like a more uh, traditional like solo kind of experience. We also want people to be able to go into solo mode and like have a either a quick race or a practice or something like that. Uh, online, uh, play competitively with each other, and then community, like, it would be hypocritical of us to make the game with the community in mind, but then not, not actually support them in the game and beyond with a, uh, a suite of com uh, community features that we call the Driver Network, which we'll have more information on next week. Nice sell, I like it, I like it. Oli, um, obviously you've been taken on board as the person that actually does the driving. Again, I'm not dissing your driving skill, I'm just <laughs> simply saying this man's a professional. I'm just curious to know, uh, how, how does the procedure work? Um, so do those guys turn around to you and go, right, we're looking at this car, you go drive the car, you come back, you try it in game and go, right, you need to tweak here, here. How does the whole process work? So similar, but what actually happened is um, I came to the to Project Cars having worked closely with BAC Mono, a car manufacturer, and we were trying to get that car as close to realism as possible. And uh, I had an hour left at the end of the day, and it just turned out I started playing more and more cars. And um, it turns out I'd driven 50 to 70 percent of the cars in the game, both track and road. Lucky enough to have driven some of these race cars that, I mean, a lot of companies like Project Cars can go and hire maybe some of the road cars to get some feelings and, and apply the sensors on there. But going and uh, racing the Le Mans 24 hours in a prototype car is, is, is something not everyone gets to do. So I go and do that, and I'm lucky enough to race uh, with the Formula One calendar with World Series at tracks like Monaco, these kind of rare places. And I come back and exactly that, yeah, I say, this track should be like this, this curb's not there, it's like this, it rains more here on these days than it does on these days, it's this amount of cars on this track and the car should oversteer when it's in third gear doing this. Really, really detailed stuff yeah. that maybe some other cars and some other games and cars don't have that. So it, uh, it keeps the game fresh, keeps the cars as realistic as possible and more than any other game I've ever seen, the visuals are, are pretty impeccable. Okay, I'm, I'm going to ask a question now, I'm going to be as succinct as I can, but if I waffle, I apologize, okay? Because it's the first time I'm bringing this up. With, with, with simulation racing games, okay, you're trying to get as close to the reality of the car as possible, but each gaming series, each franchise, obviously based on the developer uh, progress, has that distinct flavor that marks it as their own. So, just sort of bringing up what you said in the presentation, obviously at, th at this point, Christmas, you guys are the only car simulation game coming out, but in that wider spec of fours of Gran Turismo, how, how do you get as close and an accurate to uh, the real simulation of a racing car or any car, and yet keep yourselves distinct from the competition? Uh, I'm maybe not talking about the, the broader game, the career, but that just fundamental getting the handle of the car, correct? Yeah. Yeah. yeah? yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, I think the 
Uh, the very the very quick answer is that you know other games and other manufacturers and other developers and things like that will say oh yeah we go to the tracks and like we we talk to the guys and like we get all the data from the cars and things like that and we uh, go to the tracks and take loads of photos and things like that and try to get the experience as accurate as possible well yeah we do that as well um, but that's only so far that only gives you kind of mathematical data I think where we differ is where we go. We have additional like emotional like an attachment to that. You know, I th we've we've driven the Nordschleife, for example, and you know, for, for me, the Nordschleife already has like a lot of uh, verticality to it. Um, it's got a lot of escalation and things like that. You know, t you turn one corner and it feels like there's a wall in front of you because it's so steep in front of you that you just turn the, that corner. It's a right hander uphill, and you just kind of think, oh my god, like oh my, this this is right in front of me now, and I've got it feels like a, a real steep climb. If you actually got just the mathematical data to, for that, it would feel like it, it might not be as obvious. It might not have that emotional attachment to how you actually experienced it in real life as well. You know, and people like Ollie as well. You know, yeah, we have the mathematical data, and we have. Rene Rast, who's a GT3 driver who can get within one tenth of his Le Mans time in the game as he does in real life. So that's cool things, but like it's more to do with like the emotional aspect of it as well, like making you feel like, oh my God, like this, the sensation of speed. I like, we hate to use that word visceral, but like it's true, like making you feel like that visceral um, sensation of speed, like getting across things like G forces and things that like you guys experience in real life, but the average Joe doesn't experience like sat on their couch, you know, playing on Xbox One, right? So we have to do other things to kind of get those um, physical like sensations over, and I think that's probably where we differ. Like you know, audio. I think oh, our audio has always been amazing in terms of, like we overmodulate certain things to make it sound like it's like you know really uh, like again visceral like really loud and like you know uh, we have all the uh, the grit that hits the bottom of the cars like you can hear that tinkering away underneath things like that. lots of little details things like that and then obviously you know drivers like Ollie telling us exactly like that last 10% of detail that gets us like above and beyond the competition. So, so it does feed back into you Ollie then I mean these guys may map out accurately a, a racetrack as it is based in real life but there is that clear distinction between the mathematical working your way around the track and the feel of it when you're driving. I mean, is that input that you have as well beyond just the actual car handling, but the tracks themselves, sort of how they feel to you? You know, you might see a corner and you'll have a very distinct gut reaction to that corner that you're looking for them to translate into the game. Is that sort of like something you get information you give them? Yeah, exactly. The the emotional side of, of the visual point of views as well as just the handling, which is which is the mathematical side plus a few of the, the key points that I can help out with in terms of what I've experienced and feeling the cars. But yeah, like you say, some of the tracks and some of the emotional points that, that the game gets across and the detail they go into, for instance, where the sun rises and sun sets and where the rain comes in is exactly how it would be on that track in real life. So people can experience it who maybe have done track days there who do actually race so that suddenly the market you're appealing to is much much wider and also the guys who who haven't had the opportunity to do that and they're playing it because they wish they were racing drivers people are getting very very savvy these days and, and games are having to keep up with that so finite details like that and emotions like that have to be really up to scratch these days which i think sets project cars apart I mentioned during the presentation about 12k. How small of a percentage of your audience do you think is going to be able to stretch to that? Well, I mean, I, you know, I, I agree, you know, but um, there are already people out there who spend a lot of money on like amazing sim rigs, like play seats, expensive wheels and things like that. You know, 4K TVs are like getting like more and more affordable, things like that. A lot of people are moving to 3D TVs already now as well. So like, yeah, obviously, you know, it's not for everybody. OK, you know, maybe Bruce Wayne can like, you know, uh, get it, you know, but then also it's a technology that we always, you know, we always try to jump on new technologies like this, you know, so whether it's uh, working with NVIDIA closely, you know, their, their new graphics cards, the GeForce GTX Titans, you know, they're amazing cards. So making sure that those work, making sure that it also works on like small handheld devices like the NVIDIA Shield, making sure it works on your Vita for remote play, making sure it works with Oculus Rift as well. They're all new technologies, new toys that we kind of you know, we're all kids at the end of the day. We always want to jump on the next new thing to play with, things like that. So, you know, yeah, I know, you know, not a lot of people are going to be able to play it, but like, it's an experience, you know, it's something that is, will happen one day in the future and we are ready for it right now. Why have I got a funny feeling you guys did this in the studio just so you, so you could expense a few couple of 4K TVs? Like, yeah, no, we need this, we need this. We've all been there, I tell you that. 
But uh, community, talking about community, obviously, like you said, big, big feature, an integral part of the game is the community and basically your feedback and you working with them. Now, where do you draw the line between taking in what the community say, what the community wants, and saying, well, no, we understand where you're coming from, but we may not necessarily either have the time or wish to do this because we have that vision. Where, where's the line? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's kind of a, um, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a balancing act, absolutely. Um, but also, um, you know, we've been teaching the community on how games are made in general. You know, and we get a lot of questions of like, why are you doing this instead of this, or why are you spending this time over here? Like, and so we obviously have to teach people how game development works in general. But then equally, it makes us reconsider our own practices, you know? So when people are saying, why are you doing this instead of this? We actually look and go, yeah, why are we doing that instead of this, you know? So actually, it actually helps us improve our own like methods and uh, a way of making games. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. As soon as we launched, there were thousands of people joining, thousands of comments on like the very simple like design overview that we'd put up there. Um, lots of people talking. We instantly had to hire a lot of community ambassadors and like community forum manager, things like that to kind of like filter everything through and like work out what is important and what is, uh, what is uh, um, like the key features for the game and things like that. But ultimately it's kind of self-policing. You know, we see that like the biggest forum threads are the one, the hot topic, you know, things to talk about. Um, we obviously have a, a range of like different tool packs for people to um, uh, uh, get, uh, um, get into the game in the first place, you know. Um, Obviously, we listen to like the people who have uh, uh, paid more, but then that doesn't mean they're always right, you know. But so then, equally, it's like as I said, self-policing. Like we find out what the general consensus is. If it's a real 50-50 thing, we put it to a vote, you know. But otherwise, you know, we put polls up to like see what what wheels do you guys use? What are the most important things there? We want to add this go mode. Is that important to you guys? Yes, no, whatever. Um, so yeah, it's it is a back a bit of back and forth. But I think the testament to it is that. We're releasing soon. We're coming out. It's happened. We're the first AAA game to have ever done this, and it's coming out soon in November. And it actually worked. So, yeah, I think the proof is in the pudding, really. Yeah, no pressure whatsoever. Then no pressure. Well, guys, listen. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk. Just have a great games call. Thanks very much. Cheers. Yeah, thank you very much. journey, one destination.